morning and uh, there's plenty of people already. So uh, Efrat stayed up uh, late. <laughs> So she can introduce our speaker for today. Uh, take it away. Fast. But we won, we won the elections. Yeah. Just oh, now. Totally. One, one really? Thing. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, it's really a great pleasure uh, to present uh, Coco that everyone knows, but still I present him uh, in his uh, PhD seminar. Uh, Coco did his uh, first degree in uh, the institute at the Institute. Uh, Actually, has, uh, he did uh, his degree both in uh, atmospheric sciences and in geology, uh, and it was not standard when he did that. And uh, I think uh, this is because he really loves and interested in, in both. Uh, he moved to master and then to direct PhD. Uh, he working on high precipitation event. Uh, he will tell you all about it soon. Uh, Yuda and myself uh, advising uh, Coco. Uh, and uh, before I let him talk, I would just say that uh, it's really wonderful to have students like Coco. And I'm sure uh, Yuda will agree with me that, um, yeah, actually we are his advisor, but uh, most often I think we are asking for his advice. Um, so uh, yeah, Coco, please tell us about your PhD research. Thanks Efrat for this great introduction. Uh, so I'll start. Heavy precipitation events in the Eastern Mediterranean are characterized by distinct rainfall patterns. We can see, for example, from this slide, two very distinct patterns. The left image shows an event in which rainfall was present all over our region, from Arabia to Turkey. And the right one shows an event in which rainfall was only produced from a single cloud. Today, I'm going to present the features governing rainfall patterns and how exactly they dictate the kind of floods we are experiencing. I will also show what we should expect if these events occur at the end of the 21st century and discuss the insights we can gain from present day observations to past climates in our region. Before we start, I first want to thank my advisors, Efrat and Yuda, who spent an enormous amount of time with me to discuss my research expose me to other studies and opportunities, uh, help me with the funding and that were always available to read and comment on everything I wrote. More importantly, I want to thank them for their mentorship, not only in scientific pathways, but rather in a more general sense, for their kindness, keenness to work together and their generosity. I also want to thank my friends from the Hydrometeorology Lab who are always available to chat, have coffee together and sometimes even work on scientific projects. Other friends have helped me with my research and led me into their project, thus widening my perspective on science. I also want to thank the professors who helped me with my PhD and that encouraged me through long talks on the way to a lot and the mountains of Utah. I want to thank the administrative staff and the teachers here who taught me how to study deeper what I'm interested in. I owe a lot to them, to my other friends not listed here, to my family and probably to a lot of other people who I forgot to mention. Finally, I'd like to thank Dana, who is the most important person supporting what you will see here today, and that without her, all this work would have sounded gibberish to you. I'd also like to thank the science foundations and the institutions supporting this research with data and funding. Often, when we, when we try to interpret geological records, such as the ones coming from the Dead Sea, we forget they represent the integration of individual events. For example, if we look at periods with rising or falling lake levels, these are composed of numerous layers, sometimes deposited during single events, such as the one on this photo. Many studies have made the relation between present day climatic conditions to those we see from geological archives. They pointed to large scale teleconnections or the change of specific synoptic circulation patterns that could have affected the hydrology of the Dead Sea. However, as, I will, so, I, as I, I will soon show, some individual events are so significant that we should really have a better understanding of them in present day to be able to interpret climate, the climate of the past. We term these events heavy precipitation events, and this will be the focus of my talk today. The region I study is the Eastern Mediterranean, situated between the Mediterranean and temperate climates to the arid climates of the desert of the deserts to the south and east of it. In this region, 
heavy precipitation events are not only important in the interpretations of geological records, but they are also closely tied to water availability, to the generation of flash floods, and to urban flooding. As an example to the contribution of such events to water resources, this graph shows the contribution of, of such events uh, to the Kinneret. Uh, it shows the lake level changes, changes from the past winter uh, here in an orange line. Most of the level rise is concentrated during specific and rather short events, these ones, and I highlight them in yellow. I also highlighted in red bars the most intense rain days in the lake's basin. As you can see, each one of the large level rises is preceded by a uh, by an intense rain day. Even if we only consider the fast response of the hydrological system, we see that more than 40% of the water is coming from only six storm this winter. Of course, there is a slower hydrologic response coming for, for example, from, spring, from springs, which are also feeding from the same events. Therefore, I think we can say that the majority of water in the Kinneret is coming from only a few storms each year. These are exactly the kind of events that leave a mark in the geological record, and they are the ones that are most important for water resources. They also account for other natural hazards, such as flash floods and debris flows. So I hope that by now you can appreciate the contribution of such events to geological archives, and more generally to the people living in this region. Precipitation is a highly complicated phenomenon. It is a function of many other variables. For example, if we change the wind field, precipitation would have to change. Precipitation is also a function of the atmospheric moisture content, which by itself is a function of temperature, the wind field, evaporation, and so on. There are analytical and empirical relationships between the precipitation and other variables. For example, the clausius clapeyron relationship it predicts that we would get more precipitation as temperature goes up. However, this kind of analytical law could not explain all of the complicated changes that happen. For this reason, people often use global numerical climate models. These show a significant decrease in precipitation in vicinity to the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. So as I said, we expect that as temperature goes up, there will be an intensification of extreme rain rates because of the higher moisture content in the atmosphere. In the Mediterranean, we can also expect an overall drying. But what about heavy precipitation events? Should they show a decrease in precipitation or an increase caused by the higher rain rates? As I said, we can try to figure this out from numerical global climate model. So this map shows the 95th percentile of rainfall as a proxy of heavy precipitation. We can see an increase in this index to the east of our region and a decrease to the west. But if we look at this map closely, we can see that the resolution of global climate models is so coarse that the same pixel shows results for the south and Negev and for the coastal plain. So is the expected change the same in Neots Madar as it is in Hadera? Not only that, some processes that are crucial for extreme precipitation, such as the generation of convective clouds, are not resolved by such coarse models. The clouds that we see here, raining on Maftesh Ramon, are on the order of just a few kilometers. So even if we take the climate model with the finest resolution that was published for our region, it is still not enough. Moreover, the statistical indices may hide important insight regarding individual events. This raises many questions. When we do have an event, it affects many regions at once. Should we expect heavy precipitation events to become larger or smaller? What about rain rates within these events? Will these differ between different regions of the Eastern Mediterranean? These questions help me to put out the perspective of this study, which we can understand from the term heavy precipitation events. We only consider the largest events. We then study their rainfall patterns and we use an event perspective, meaning that we consider one event as a whole at each time, instead of using the statistics of all rain days, as people often do. This leads me to the goals of this study, which moves between spatial and temporal scales, starting from meteorology and passing through surface processes, from the present to the future, and then back to the past. 
I will start by talking about the relationship between synoptic scale circulation and rainfall. Then I will characterize rainfall patterns during heavy precipitation events in present day. This will lead me to the effects of global warming on rainfall patterns. I will also explain the relation of different rainfall patterns to flash floods. And finally, I will discuss some implications of rainfall patterns in the present to past climates. I'll start with the relation of synoptic systems to rainfall. To begin, I want to build a basic language for the synoptic scale conditions associated with heavy precipitation events in our region. Mediterranean cyclones are the main contributors to water resources in the north part of our region, producing 90% of all rainfall. Low level cyclones, or troughs, as here in brown, and combined with an upper level trough or a low here in blue, generate heavy rainfall in our region. In the Negev Desert, roughly a third of the major floods can be attributed to Mediterranean cyclones. But if these floods occur at the Negev, far from the Mediterranean Sea, we should probably ask ourselves, where does the moisture to such rainfall come from? So for Mediterranean cyclones, we can say that the moisture comes from the Eastern Mediterranean. We know that because we have analyzed Lagrangian back trajectories showing the pathways of air parcels at various altitudes. The second synoptic system I want you to have in mind when we talk about heavy precipitation is the active Red Sea trough. It is a surface trough that is accompanied by an upper level trough. However, as we will see later, the rainfall produced by such a system is often quite local, as we can see with this single cloud here. They trigger roughly 40% of the major floods in the Negev. Moisture for active Red Sea troughs arrives from the Red Sea, but in some cases it could also come from the Mediterranean or from an upper level jet, which brings moisture from distant sources. The third and last synoptic system I will mention is the tropical plume. This kind of system accounts for wide, widespread rainfall, but it is quite rare. It triggers less than 10% of the floods in the Negev. Moisture plumes, as the one here, are driven by the front edge of an upper level trough. They originate from distant sources in Central Africa or the Eastern Atlantic Ocean. This moisture may also be supplemented by nearby sources such as the Mediterranean or the Red Sea. Because it often comes from quite a distance and because the meteorological forcing is on a large scale, rainfall often falls everywhere in the study area. So just to briefly sum this part, we have three main synoptic systems associated with heavy precipitation, each with its own special, char special characteristics and a different fraction of the floods and all of them are accompanied by an upper level trough. From the synoptics, we'll move on to characterize rainfall patterns in present day. I will briefly go through the two main tools we used in this study. On the right hand side, the red circle shows the range of a weather radar situated at the center of Israel. Francesco Mara provided us with a radar archive of roughly 24 years of high quality data in a one kilometer, five minute resolution. Radar data is the only kind of data which enables us to analyze rainfall patterns at a suitable resolution. And it is the only kind of data available for the whole region, including the desert. This archive enables us to quantify rainfall in ungaged regions, to characterize rainfall patterns and to identify historic events. It must be noted, though, that some problems may still be present in this kind of data because it is a remote sensing method and not a direct measurement. But after all the corrections we used, the radar is the closest we can get to a ground truth for rainfall all over our region. The other tool we used is the weather, weather research and forecasting model, WORF, which is the state of the art in terms of weather models. The model runs downscaling simulations, meaning that it uses all the basic equations as the global models, but on a higher resolution. Therefore, it needs to get input data from a coarser model. In my study, I have tailored the model to the Eastern Mediterranean. The configuration we used is composed of three nested domains with input data here 
at roughly 80 kilometers resolution coming from global reanalysis data. This data goes through the outer nest marked in purple and are downscaled to 25 kilometers. From there, they are downscaled twice more to give results in a one kilometer resolution. At this resolution, the model can represent convective processes explicitly, so we can better trust its results for convective rainfall. One kilometer resolution is the same as the radar data we have, so the results are comparable. To the best of my knowledge, this is the highest resolution weather model at this extent that was run for the Eastern Mediterranean, which generated one of the largest datasets worldwide of modeling results at this resolution. This is why it took us a few months to complete the simulations. The main idea behind the simulation is to see if we can get simulated rainfall, uh, simulated rainfall patterns that are similar to the observed patterns. If we do get good results, we can then use the model both to analyze the data from a meteorological perspective and to get predictions for events in different climate states. We wanted to extract heavy precipitation events from the radar archive, but our data spans from the desert to the wet Lebanon mountains. Therefore, to identify events both from the desert and from the wetter region, we had to account for the varying climatology. To this end, we applied a pixel-based approach in which we set a threshold for each of the 100,000 pixels in the radar range. We took the 99.5 percentile from the time series of each pixel and defined it as a heavy precipitation event relative to this pixel. We compare this threshold with data from rain gauges and it is roughly equivalent to events of two to five years return period, meaning our events are large but not necessarily the most extreme events. Then we aggregated pixels and kept only events which were large enough. We repeated this process several times for different rainfall durations lasting between one and 72 hours. Because of course, the threshold of rainfall for short duration is not the same as for long durations. At the end of this process, we are left with 41 objectively identified heavy precipitation events 35 of them are Mediterranean cyclones, and the rest were classified as active Red Sea troughs. In climatolo climatological terms, heavy precipitation events have a similar climatology as rain days, but they are more pronounced here in orange at the beginning of the winter. Active Red Sea troughs were found at the beginning of the winter and in spring. We also check the spatial distribution of events. Dots in this map represent the center of mass of precipitation of each of the events we identified, separated into Mediterranean cyclones and active red sea troughs. As you can see, their centers are focused near the coastline, but they are more concentrated over the sea in the fall, here in yellow, and they move inland as winter comes and even more in spring marked in red. Until now, we only saw properties of events from the radar, but let's compare them with results of the weather model. The map on the left is the total rainfall from all events together derived from the radar archive. And the map on the right shows the same from the WORF model. We must note that there are some regions in which we should suspect the radar data. For example, these are blocked radar beams. I plotted below the bias between the radar and the model. And on the right, we see data from rain gauges. The model and the radar agree for most of the study region here. But in contrast, when we go towards Jordan or the Golan Heights, we see a positive bias. Zooming in to the northeast of our study region, we see a great reduction in radar rainfall, which is not present in rain gauge observations. This probably means we have some range degradation in the radar data. For this reason, we chose only to consider the regions in which work to radar bias is reasonable, marked here with a black line. Let's focus on the first event in our archive, which is a Mediterranean cyclone from November 1991. From the radar data, we can see that there is a maximum in rainfall accumulation 
period next to the coastline. The weather model shows an almost identical pattern, except maybe for a positive bias seen in the Negev. However, we actually expect the radar to produce lower rain amounts when we look at regions far away into the desert because of uh, the range effects. It's important to note that not all events are simulated as well as this one. And in fact, two active red sea troughs lasting just a few hours and precipitating locally over small regions were poorly simulated. To understand the effect of precipitation on floods, we need not only to consider rain amounts, but also the space-time structure of precipitation. This is why we decompose the rainfall field into different factors. In this graph, each dot represents the rainfall field uh, comparison between the modeled and observed rainfall accumulation from one event. The vertical axis represents the amplitude of rainfall, which is a normalized me measure of the total rainfall volume. Positive values means there was a positive bias, and negative values means there is a, a negative bias uh, with less rainfall in the model than in the radar data, where zero is a perfect score, perfect rainfall volume. The dashed line is the median, and the gray box here is the interquartile range. We see that the median of all events is a positive bias, which is similar to what we saw from the first event. The horizontal axis is the structural component of rainfall. It is a measure of how small and picky versus large and smooth are the rain objects. Negative values point to smaller rain objects, while positive values are objects that are too smooth or large. From the median of events on the structure axis, we see that the structure is almost perfectly simulated. The location of the rain is the last component in this graph. It, represent, it is represented by the color of each dot. Again, zero is a perfect score, and two is the worst score we can get. Almost all events are quite accurately located, as we can see from the blue colors of the dots. But I highlighted two events in which the location component is quite high and the amplitude is really low. These are the two active red sea troughs that were really poorly simulated. A further analysis that we, that we made showed um, that for these rain objects, and I'm not showing it this here, the rain cells are really localized, specifically in active red sea troughs. So to conclude this comparison, we see that the model provides good results in terms of the structure and the location of the rain, but has a positive bias. To quickly summarize this part of the study, we saw the identification and simulation of 41 heavy precipitation events. We saw that high resolution simulation is skillful in predicting the structure and location of rainfall, but it still has a positive bias. We also saw some climatological features of heavy precipitation events, which I will not repeat for the sake of time. And anyway, I'm going to go back to present day rainfall patterns near the end of my talk. Now that we know we can trust the, the weather model and to what degree we can trust it, I want to use it to understand this, the expected changes in heavy precipitation events in times of global warming. In this part of the study, I will examine what happens to events we already know from the past if they are to affect our region in a warmer climate as we expect to have in the future. Will they look as crazy as in this movie with more intense precipitation than we already have? Or maybe they will show a drying pattern as we project for the mean climate. Previous studies have shown that the frequency of Mediterranean cyclones marked here in blue is expected to decrease because of global warming, implying that rainfall in our region will decrease, but we don't know what it means for rainfall extremes. Globally speaking, it seems that the change in annual maximum precipitation resembles the change in annual precipitation. So maybe decreased extremes? On a closer look, we see a more complex pattern, but still maybe mainly a decrease in rainfall extreme in, in annual maximum precipitation in this graph. 
However, these statistical perspective, perspectives don't provide much sense in terms of specific events. How are they expected to change? Where is the change occurring? And should we expect heavy precipitation events to get more or less intense? We already know from before that our high resolution weather model is skillful in predicting most heavy precipitation events when it uses global reanalysis data. We know that the results are good because we compare them to a long record of radar data. Now we can also add the signature of climate change into this model. And the question we ask is what's going to happen to the same events if they will occur under a warmer climate? To this end, we use a methodology called pseudo-global warming. The methodology uses results of global climate models. We use results from an ensemble mean of 29 CIMIT-5 models on a business as usual scenario, the RCP 8.5 scenario, which assumes the governments of the world would not do enough to fight global warming, which will cause severe consequences by the end of this century. To use the data from the global models, we took the average of all sorts of climate variables on a monthly basis projected for the end of this century and subtracted from it the average for the end of the last century. This difference of delta is the change we apply to our model for its initial and boundary conditions, which except for this change are the same as we used for our previous simulations. As an example to this change, this map presents the delta in temperature for the 500 hectopascal pressure level, with an increase of roughly 5 degrees in our region. We apply these changes to our limited area model differently for each grid cell and each vertical level. The changes were made to pressure, wind, temperature, and moisture fields on a monthly basis meaning that the changes we apply are different whether the event occurred in October or whether it happened in April. We then ran the same 41 heavy precipitation events as before and asked how rainfall patterns in these events will change because of the changes we apply. Going back to the event we already saw here from November 1991, we can try to see how it is expected to change if it will occur at the end of this century. This map was shown earlier and represents the rainfall accumulation simulated for the entire event. When we perform a similar simulation under future pseudo-global warming conditions, you can see that the amount of rainfall had reduced substantially. We see a decrease of roughly 20% on average. We can also examine the temporal change in precipitation in this event. So this plot shows the rain rate over time throughout the event. In blue, we see the historic event, and in orange is the future event. Sorry. So we compare the durations of the central 90% of precipitation during each of the events. The graph on the right shows the distribution of these durations. The median of the durations across all events turned out to be roughly three hours shorter in future events compared to the historic ones. We also looked at the maximum 10 minute rain rate at all time steps, where we only look for the maxima, neglecting their spatial location. So for example, in this case, we see that the maximum for future rain rates in this event is much higher than the maximum for the uh, historic event. We'll get back to the maximum rain rates in a minute, but before I want to show you the rainfall accumulation from all of the events together, plotted here in these maps. The maps show that the decrease in rainfall we saw for the first event is happening throughout the events. There is a substantial decrease in rainfall in almost all areas of the study region. This accounts for roughly 21% decrease. We also compared different parts of the study region. So we divided it into sea versus land. And within the land, we, we further divided it into desert and Mediterranean regions. Then we took the same time series we saw before 
and accumulated the mean rain rate to have a measure of the total rainfall in each of these regions. The results are shown here on the right as violin plots, in which each dot is one event, the white dot represents the median of events, and the small gray box is the interquartile range, as in box plots. The lighter shade represents the historic events, and the stronger shade represents the future events. So as you can see, the median of rain amounts over land decreases. The same is true for the sea area represented here in blue. And also for the Mediterranean, and actually also for the desert areas. So there is a decrease in total rainfall amounts in each of these regions. In contrast, when we look at the maximum short duration rain rate somewhere and sometime within each of the events, as we saw before, we see a substantial increase in each of these regions. So total rain is going down and the maximum rain rates are going up with global warming. To sum this part of the study, we saw that rainfall during heavy precipitation events in the future is expected to decrease substantially by more than 20%. In contrast, maximum rain rates increase by about 19% and the events become shorter by about 6%. I didn't have time to show it, but we have initial results suggesting that the changes are caused by shallower cyclones and that they respond to the interaction between thermodynamic and dynamic variables. So maybe when we think about future heavy precipitation events, we should imagine something like in this photo. Most of the area is covered by relatively shallow clouds with much less rainfall. But somewhere and sometime within these events, we get a far more developed cloud with high rain rates for a short duration. We can also compare our results with independent results just submitted to publication, which are based on statistical considerations. This shows that the two-year return period rainfall is supposed to decrease all over our region, in agreement with the decreased rainfall we talked about. However, the 100-year return period rainfall gets higher in some regions. Specifically, we see an increase next to the sea, which resembles our results for the maximum intensity of rain during heavy precipitation events. So if we think about it from the perspective of water resources, this would probably lead to a decline in the availability of water in our region. From the future, I want to move back to the present and focus on the relation of rainfall patterns and flash floods. I will, I will focus on just a few case studies coming from the arid part of the study region in which major floods were triggered. We will zoom in on six cases two of each of the synoptic systems we discussed before, and compare observed properties of rainfall and flash floods between these events. To summarize the different rainfall patterns during these events and their relation to floods, this graph shows the area which is covered by a certain amount of, of rainfall for, three, for the three types of synoptic systems. The different lines and the areas in between them represent the various durations examined, which exhibited the highest rainfall amounts during the event. Let's look, for example, at the 20 millimeter rainfall threshold for tropical plumes here in orange. The area which is covered by 20 millimeter of rainfall during three hours is roughly 150 square kilometers, while the same threshold for 24 hours covers a much larger area, 8,000 square kilometers. In contrast, during the active Red Sea troughs here in yellow, the 20 millimeter threshold covers a larger area for three hours duration, suggesting that uh, there were higher rain rates. But the 24 hours duration shows an almost, uh, this, uh, almost the same area. This means that rainfall in active Red Sea troughs precipitate during a really short time window from small scale convective rain cells with most of the area not experiencing any rain at all. While for tropical plumes, rainfall continue, continues to precipitate during a much longer time period over large areas. Mediterranean cyclones in blue show a behavior which is something in between these two extremes. Rainfall is generated 
through small scale, small duration uh, rain cells, but it accumulates over time to large amounts. The high rain rates seen over the smaller areas are coming mostly from the northern part of the study region. So I'm not sure they will produce much flash floods. So how exactly do these different rainfall patterns affect flash floods? We'll use an example to answer this question. These are three flood hydrographs from three different storms. The duration of the flood during the Mediterranean cyclone, here in blue, is long, but its peak discharge noted on the right axis is relatively small. Looking at tropical plumes or active red sea troughs with discharge noted on the left vertical axis, we see that the peak discharge is much higher and that the flood associated with the tropical plume was much longer than the flood uh, from the active red sea trough. Accordingly, the volume of the flood during the tropical plume was 10 times larger than during the active red sea trough. But the volume during the Mediterranean cyclone is similar to the active red sea trough, although it had a much smaller peak discharge. We used all the hydrological data from these events and we can now compare the peak discharge on the x-axis to the volume of the flood on the y-axis for all floods together. From this comparison, we can see that indeed peak discharge is rather small in Mediterranean cyclone floods, and, but it's relatively high in active red sea trough floods. And in tropical plumes, we see both a high peak discharge and a high volume of floods. Comparing all the floods to the envelope curve of the Eastern Mediterranean here in black, which is supposed to show the highest possible discharge for every catchment area, we see that floods during tropical plumes, the ones here in orange, tend towards the envelope curve, while floods in active red sea trough could be of really high to really low magnitude, and the floods during Mediterranean cyclones are usually on the lower peak discharge side, side of this graph. What we cannot see from this graph about active red sea troughs is that actually most of the catchments were not activated during these storms because rainfall is so localized. So now let's leave the synoptics for a minute and examine the differences between desert floods in red and the Mediterranean catchment floods in blue. We see here the same kind of graphs, volume of floods, this time on the x-axis, and peak discharge on the y-axis. So as you can see, the desert floods, they tend towards high peak discharge, while the Mediterranean floods tend towards high volume. So what does the high peak discharge that we see here and also here mean for uh, large desert streams? To answer this question, I got help from Elad Dente, which used remote sensing uh, to track the evolution of Nahal Arava, the largest tributary to the Dead Sea from the south. Over the last three decades, large-scale geomorphic effects were recorded in Nahal Arava just a few times. For example, for example, these images taken before and after an event shows the avulsion of the main channel and the formation of new gullies. We also found bank failure that, were, that was caused by an event which happened in 2014. This kind of floods also supply large sediment plumes into the Dead Sea. We found that the largest effects we saw have always corresponded to tropical plumes. This is because such events are characterized by the simultaneous high peak discharge at all catchment scales, meaning that the small streams are activated at the same time to produce the highest magnitude floods on the larger streams. In the last few minutes, we saw a chain of factors that starts in the synoptic conditions and ends with the geomorphic work. We saw that to trigger heavy precipitation events, we need an upper level trough and a moisture source. We saw some different characteristics for the various types of rain bearing synoptic system. Mediterranean cyclones trigger rainfall mostly at the northern part of the region and generate flash floods with low peak discharge 
and relatively a high volume. Thus, they can contribute much to water resources. Active Red Sea troughs generate localized rainfall and tends to produce floods with a high peak discharge on isolated streams, while tropical plumes trigger rainfall throughout the region, creating the largest floods on desert streams and also a major geomorphic response. <coughs> Just for a few minutes, I want to see if we can get some insights from what we know now about the present to better understand the paleo environment. And for that, I will use two examples. The first one is this one. A few years ago, Mariki Albon wanted to know what could be the trigger of an intense, intense period almost 3,000 years ago with a high frequency of debris flows next to the Dead Sea. From the event perspective that we used here, we can say that the most probable system that can generate intense rainfall over such small catchments is the active Red Sea Trust. Therefore, we can suggest that this period, which is considered a dry period in our region, was characterized by a higher frequency of active Red Sea Trust. The other example is this one. We can ask what should be the difference between the rising and falling stages of Lake Lisan during the last glacial maximum? And why do we see more floods during the rising stage? The system that contributes the most water volume to the Dead Sea is the Mediterranean cyclone. This means that if we rely on present day observations, there had to be a change in either frequency location or depth of the Mediterranean cyclones. Whenever these are deep enough or have a southerly track, their convergence zone, marked here with, with the letter C, triggers rainfall over the Dead Sea catchment here, supplying much water to the Dead Sea, but also flash floods in the Judean desert. In contrast, if we have cyclones that are either too shallow or passing too much to the north, in which rainfall will only precipitate at the northern part of the Dead Sea catchment, we will have a further supply of water, but without any floods over the Judean desert. To conclude the study, we saw that heavy precipitation events are highly important for both water resources and natural hazards and therefore also have a major effect on geological archives. We saw, we saw that rainfall patterns are largely affected by synoptic scale conditions, and we distinguish between the effects of different synoptics on rainfall and flood characteristics. We saw that Mediterranean cyclones contribute much rainfall volume. Active Red Sea troughs, on the other hand, generate high peak discharge floods because of intense local rainfall, while tropical plumes have widespread rainfall and they trigger large magnitude floods, which produce geomorphic work in large streams. From this characterization of present day rainfall patterns, we also gained some insights about past climates. We saw the results of a simulation of 41 events, which proves the feasibility of predicting rainfall patterns in high resolution, especially in the Mediterranean, in Mediterranean cyclones. And finally, I showed the expected changes of heavy precipitation events under global warming. We saw a major decrease in total precipitation, an increase in local short duration rain rates, and a shortening of the event, which would probably lead to a decrease in freshwater availability in the region. So on an ending note, after we've talked about present and past rainfall patterns, and so that in the future, we may get more of the kind of storms we see here, which may be weaker on average, but here and there are more violent. I believe this is another good reason to think about our strategies to mitigate the adverse effects of climate change. I'd like to thank again my friends, colleagues and advisors for letting me into their studies and helping me with my study. Their support and ideas are truthfully what brought me to the end of my PhD. Thank you all for listening. All right. Thank you, uh, Coco. That was great. Thank you. Uh, and uh, yeah. <laughs>
and I'm sure that we have, uh, people have a ton of questions. Uh, there are uh, almost a hundred people right now listening. So uh, you can, you can uh, either uh, raise your hand, uh, you know, uh, on Zoom or ask me if you can ask a question. Okay, I see that Uri Dayan has probably a bunch of questions. So you can, you can start. Uh, first of all, uh, Coco, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation that you gave and the very interesting result. I'm really surprised. Um, I, uh, I have only small, a small um, question or comment, uh, which of course won't change the very good result you obtained. I'm quite surprised with the upper level pattern uh, that you showed associated with uh, active red sea trough. The 500 hectopascal GPH, uh, which is associated with the active red sea trough, I would expect a, an accentuated trough mm -hmm. penetrating south over Egypt as Kahana and others have shown. It's in the beginning of your presentation. This one. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a, there's a shallow trough at the upper levels. You see this one? And yes, this one. Yeah. If you look at the blue lines, it seems to insinuate as as if you are in the forefront of a, a subtropical, I don't know, a high pressure system at upper levels. Yeah. And uh, usually I would expect an accentuated trough uh, in the forefront of Israel. So this is, <clears throat> this is just one example I wanted to show because uh, we see here the distinct rainfall patterns, which are that we have only a single clouds precipitating. It's not uh, an average or something like this, like an average of all events, just one cloud. So that's maybe that's the not, not the most common situation, but actually in these days, it was, I think, November 2013. We had day after day, a similar situation to this one in which we had rainfall uh, in different places of the country, each time in a different place and from one or two clouds. Uh, so a shallow, trough in the upper levels and the, the, this um, red sea trough with the uh, center, you can call it a center uh, axis. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's a composite which shows a somewhat different picture, but okay, it's clear. Right, we have uh, Pinchas and then Dorita with questions. Okay, uh, I very much enjoyed your talk, Moshe, and I want to point to three earlier works that are not well known, that used similar approach or that have shown similar results. The first one, which is very surprising to me, that it's not being uh, referred to, is the work with Segal and with uh, Moshe Mandel and Uri Stein, that we published in 1994. I think this is the first, I'm not sure you noticed that, but this is the first one using the same approach you were doing here. That means simulating with a mesoscale model. At that time, we didn't have the warp. It was the ML4, which was the version before, before warp. And we introduced profiles from large scale doubling of CO2. I recommend, if you didn't see it, I recommend you to look at it because we get interesting results for three case studies of Mediterranean cycle, cycles laws. This is one comment. The second comment uh, relates to the main results that you have shown which is very nice, the reduction in rainfall, total rainfall, and the increase in heavy precipitation. I gave it the title, the Mediterranean paradox. And I think there is good reason to call it Mediterranean paradox, because in other regions in the world, or let's say it's the other way, in 90% of the world, 
it doesn't go this way. Either both total and every precipitation go up or both go down. This is the typical uh, climate change, change in precipitation that we see all over the world. Mediterranean is unique and uh, this should be pointed out. I call it, as I say, the Mediterranean paradox. And I think you, this is certainly something you noticed. And uh, the last thing that I enjoyed is comparison of a uh, flood volume against peak discharge. There is a review with uh, Shensis and Laron that I see from your, uh, that you are familiar with it, yeah. in which we compare the Mediterranean cyclone against active red sea trough, the profiles that you have shown so nicely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pinchas. Um, uh, just ask you to, uh, if you have, please ask questions. If you have, uh, don't start a new, a new lectures, okay? Um, because it's uh, we, we have a uh, limited time. Uh, Dorita, go ahead. Yes, uh, well, Coco, very, very nice uh, presentation and mm -hmm. very nice uh, research. Um, I was wondering, um, I, I have uh, two questions. One, you show that in the climatology, most intensive uh, Mediterranean cyclones uh, are seen in early winter. Um, you show that the very beginning of your uh, presentation. You mean this? Yes. Yeah. So in the distribution of uh, events that you chose, uh, mm -hmm. do they show the same trend? The, the, the most uh, intensive that you chose were in the early um, winter? I'm not sure because mm -hmm. we didn't compare the amounts in between the events because they are sometimes not comparable because we used uh, events both from the from the Negev, which could be like 20 millimeters of rainfall, which is a heavy precipitation event in the in the desert, but it's not considered a, a big event in the northern part. Mm -hmm. And then if you go to the coastal plains, probably uh, an event would only be considered if you have, I don't know, a hundred millimeters of rainfall throughout this event. So I don't know what, what to say about the intensity of the events. I mean, the seasonality of the intensity of the events. Okay. I'm not sure. The other question you showed, I think, um, in one of the, your summary slides, um, that uh, the center of mass of the uh, precipitation uh, shifts inland uh, with the wet season. Yeah, we see it also here. Okay. And did you see this also when you did the simulations uh, in the future climate um, conditions? If they move inland within the season, yes, they move inland within the season, but they also moved inland uh, between the future and present in simulations, if I'm not mistaken, but I can check this map and, and show you uh, later. And what do you think is the reason, the physical reason for this inland migration within the season? And even more if, and I, as you say, you think that it is even more inland uh, in future climate simulations. Yeah, so with, within the season, I think it's the uh, maximum temperatures, which are uh, thin, over the sea at the beginning of the winter and in the autumn. And uh, if you go to the spring, then the maximum temperatures are going up uh, mainly above the, above the land. So I guess that the maximum rain rates are uh, highly tied to the maximum temperature. So if we take the, the center of mass of precipitation, it will tend towards the the higher temperatures with the higher rain rates. So when we speak about future conditions, I'm not sure about what I told you. I, I need to check it again, but um, I guess it, it is also tied to the, to the sea land gradient, which gets uh, higher 
in future simulations. So we get the land uh, overheating uh, compared to the, to the sea. And this is why I guess the, the center of mass of precipitation moves towards the land in the future simulations. Okay. okay. Yeah, we have a question by uh, Oriadam. Yes, hi. It's it's Adam. So there's a hundred people here. So I can say it. And it's Ori Adam, not Adam. Okay, sorry. Um, so um, could could you explain at least to, based on your results and to your understanding, uh, what are the underlying mechanisms uh, behind the changes that we see in high precipitation events uh, in, in 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 future events? Um, so I can give you one example, which I did not show. So for example, we see here the upper level, uh, the 500 hectopascal uh, pressure map in blue, and the lower level, the surface uh, cyclone for the first uh, heavy precipitation event, which we already focused before. And if I now turn this one, which is the future, of the same event, like the same event simulated in future climate, you can see that the, the uh, cyclone at the lower uh, levels gets a lot weaker. I mean, it, it is not as deep as this one. And we see that, uh, so if it is a lot weaker, I guess we can expect less rainfall. Although if we uh, think about uh, one spot in the space, then maybe the, the weaker, uh, gradients will uh, will create lower wind speeds, so we can get even higher rainfall accumulations over specific locations. But in general, I think that this uh, lowering of the gradients that we see here is one of the major causes uh, for the decreased precipitation. And, and I'm, I'm sorry to press on this, but to, to your understanding, what, 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 what would you associate with, with the lowering of the, these, these gradients? What, what, what sure. do you think is the physical principle? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly. So, so uh, we talk a lot about the, the northening of the storm pack, but, but we didn't impose a northening of the storm pack here. And you can see that the upper level trough is the same. So it has to be something with the dynamic of, the internal dynamic of this, uh, of this event, which I'm not sure what is the cause. I mean, this is this is exa exactly the kind of things we are uh, working on uh, these days, uh, because we have the, the results of the future simulations, and we want to really understand the the key meteorological ingredients that are causing the the differences between the future and the past. So I I hope to come back with an answer with in a few months with a better answer. Okay, thanks. Okay, we have time for uh, one or two more questions. Just open, uh, unmute yourself and ask if you have any question. I have hey. question. Oh yeah, Dorita. I almost said that Coco, uh, you're, you're off the hook, but uh, no. <laughs> um, it is it is a small feature, but. Yet, when you compared uh, the simulations to, to the radar, if you can go to one of those, maybe HPE1, uh, I do see you mentioned the bias in the south part. Yeah. OK, yes. Um, this uh, ellipse is a little bit uh, um, Mafria, uh, <laughs> to my question, but we still see that also the Kinneret, yeah, is biased. Uh, ah, no, I see. Oh, le no, let me see one thing. Yes, it is biased uh, in, in the simulations. You mm -hmm. have much less precipitation here in the Kinneret area. And I, I wanted to know whether it is all coming from the model or it could also had, have to do with the radar at that area. So we can check, we can check the, the total of all events. 
אז אם אנחנו קונצנטרט על רק סינגל איבנט, אני חושב שהתוצאות יכולות להיות סינגל קלאוד, אולי שהיה שם בהתחלה דאטה או שהיה מודל נכון, ואז אם אנחנו נשאר את כל האיבנט יחד, אנחנו נראה במפה that the bias actually in the Kinneret is not, is not so bad. I mean, okay. the yellow and the light blue colors here okay. means that there is a, a small bias. Mm-hmm. So I think the Kinneret is okay, but not all of the Kinneret basin is okay, because you see that in the Golan we have a really a large positive bias, yeah. which I think is mainly coming from the red data. Right, because you have go- good gauge, gauges there. Yeah. And I wanted to mention that, yes, it may be that in some cases, the comparison to the gauges, even for events, uh, could be relevant at areas where the radar is, uh, is far from. Yeah, this is why we did this uh, comparison, but you are right, you, you can also compare it event by event. You did it event by event too? No, we uh, did it no. for all of the events together. Okay. Okay, anyway, it is uh, kind of, it's, you are doing more of statistic, um, but yes, uh, it, 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 I think that if you have these gauges there, um, it is worth, I mean, looking, sometimes you may be punishing the model, but it is the radar. One thing that I wanted to mention though, is that although you simulated one kilometer in the model, The effective resolution of WARF is, is about seven times the grid size, okay? Yeah. Uh, so uh, in any case, a more fair comparison with the, between the model and the radar could also be to aggregate into um, uh, pixels. of seven kilometers. This mm-hmm. is uh, one of the first papers showing the efficient, effective resolution of WARF, okay? Because of, of the subgrid that is not simulated, yeah. when, okay? So I think that would be fair and even could uh, better represent the comparison between more fair for the model, because the model has a effective resolution of seven kilometers, yeah. okay? So, yeah. and I also fully agree with what is being written now in the chat. <laughs> okay. okay? Okay, read the chat. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, uh, everybody. And thank you, uh, Coco, for a, one more time for a great presentation. Um, and uh, we'll see each other uh, next week, the next seminar. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Congratulations to the supervisors. <laughs> Bye. Correct. Bye. 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 Bye.